Amen. I want to thank Charlie. Where's, where's, where's your Charlie? Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much for tying all them balloons up for them kids. Man, every kid in there was throwing some kind of balloon around, and he just had one of those, you know, talented deals with them little balloons. You can tie them, make different things. Yeah, what a blessing that was. I didn't even know that was coming, but I just wanted to thank him publicly, and I want to thank Anthony publicly. He must have, I don't know if I've ever seen anybody work so hard to make an event as good as he could make it. I mean, just built things and cleaned and washed and strung lights and what, just thank you, Anthony. I just appreciate it so much. Man, you made, you made that night as good as it could be made, I think. And if all the people wouldn't have been there, it would have been perfect. <laughs> No, that was fun. It was, that, that's what makes it fun is all the people having a good time. And he had a fire pit out there and a bunch of wood all ready to go. And we had a little fire back there and had chairs all around the fire. And, and we just had a good time. That was great. All right, let's take our Bibles. We'll be going to Genesis chapter 1 for our very first verse today. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. And I want to start out, first of all, with prayer. And I'll give you just a second or two to find Genesis 1. It ought to be easy to find. And uh, we'll read a few verses here, um, or at least one, and uh, we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer. Now, Lord God, come to you as always, and uh, just really best we can to call upon thee and thy presence to be here in our church, and not just to help me to preach, Lord, but to help your people to find the truth in the Bible and get a grasp of it and find some truth there, something to encourage them, strengthen them, challenge them. Uh, even convict, Lord, if you so will it. And I just pray, God, that your, your word would have uh, preeminence in our service today and that your spirit would open our eyes of understanding and help all your children grasp uh, the great truths that we look at today. And might we consider them and ponder them and, and uh, make use the best we can that might be pleasing to you. So I pray you help me as your minister and... Uh, Quicken me and fill me, Lord. I, I pray you set up a man lack wisdom. Let him ask of God. I'm asking, Lord. Give me some wisdom. And I pray you give it liberally. And I pray for liberty that comes with your spirit. And we'll thank you for these things, for we ask them in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, God is holy. And everything that God created is holy. He doesn't make something unholy. Or he doesn't make any, anything with any element of corruption, right? Everything that he has made is absolute perfection. God can't do something less. Uh, he only can make something 100% pure. And with that comes durability. When it is holy... There's nothing to degenerate it. There's nothing to hinder its existence. It, it just goes forever. So, so as we read this verse in verse 30, uh, just know that when God made everything, it was perfectly done, and it had no element to it of ceasing to exist or in decaying or corrupting in any way. The only reason it did come to that was because God also put it in the hands of man. And by his sovereign will, allowed all of his people to have dominion over all that he made. And when he did that, he left it upon man's free will and free choice to handle it however they want to handle it. But when he did that, he warned them and said, this is the way it needs to go, but you don't have to follow it. He didn't say it like that. He just said, this is the way it needs to go. This is what I expect this is what I want to be done. But he left it up to men. So when we see this nature thing that we got going have problems, or when we see things wear out and decay and get corrupt, it's not because God didn't make it perfect. He did make it perfect. He left it in the hands of man to defile those things, and they did. And when they defiled those things, that's when the everlasting capability that they had has now been damaged. 
And he did that, and knowing full well what man would do with it. But that's what he did. But just know that the main thing I wanted us to really get into our hearts deep today is that when God makes anything, it is perfectly 100% holy. And there is no way for what he makes perfectly to get old or corrupt or decay or tarnish. Okay? If you can get that and get it solid and then see the promises that he's given to you to accomplish that, I'm hoping that will encourage you today. And I'm hoping that it will direct your steps today. And I'm hoping that it will give you a bright goal to chase after in this little temporary life that you are here on this planet that is corrupting. And it is going away. And the heavens and the earth shall dissolve. And the earth shall reel like a drunken man. And it will reel to and fro like a drunken man and be clean dissolved. And God created in the beginning, God created in heaven and the earth, and in the end, he destroys the heaven and the earth. And the reason for it is because every aspect of it has been defiled by either man or Satan, even the third heaven. And all gets blown away because of the corruptive nature that is crept in. So let's take a look then at Genesis 1 and verse 30. And to every beast of the earth... And to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. God made everything. Uh, uh, take, uh, well, you won't have, I'm going to read this to you. This is in Psalm 30 and verse 5, if you're writing. For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. God is the God of living things. He loves life in his perfected form. Loves it. This is what he created. And this is why he created. To enjoy life. Not just people, but animals and everything that lives, he enjoys. For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning and you see the sorrow come in uh, but he changes it and turns it to joy in the end in proverbs 12 28 it says in the way of righteousness is life yeah because there's no corruption uh, righteousness is clean and holy and there's no corruption there so it lives yeah and in the pathway thereof there is no death in Psalm 16, he says, In the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. In John, he says, I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. In John 17, he says, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. In Romans 8, he says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In Romans 8, 10, it says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And the Bible talks about souls and he talks about dead souls and he talks about living souls and he's not the god of the dead souls he's only the god of the living souls he is not the god of the dead somebody else is the god of the dead but not him he likes purity holiness righteousness everlasting life he likes life and 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 all that goes with that there are in the bible there are good works and there are dead works. There are living works and dead works. And you can do either one. You can do something that means nothing. Uh, something that will just perish. Or you can do something that's everlasting. What a thought. What a thought for a decaying world. Amen. What rejuvenating uh, uh, joy that I have in my heart thinking something good can come out of this? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely something good can come out of this. 
Uh, there, are, there are dead souls, there are living souls, there are dead works, there are living works, there are dead faith and living faith. There is a faith that destroys and kills the souls of men and women, and there is a righteous faith that makes them pure. You know of that, don't you? If you know of that, say amen. 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 There, there is a faith that makes holy and pure and everlasting, and there is a faith that totally kills it's in the God of this world, or it's in other gods other than the creator that made all things. And people can invest in either one, and one lives and one dies. One goes away and one lasts forever. And I want us to see something in Hebrews. If you take your Bible and go to Hebrews chapter 3. And I want you to see, as you already know, actually, but I want us to focus on this idea uh, because it'll be something that we can emulate or something that we can do as well. And it's found in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4. And it's an amazing thing uh, because God, uh, God has done something pure and uh, everlasting uh, existence was the result. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 4, and the Bible says, For every house is builded by some man. Is that true? I don't know of one where that's not true. <laughs> I don't know a house anywhere that some man didn't build. Amen. So all of us have done that. I can remember being a little boy, and at my beginning, it was a little house of cards. And I would build it. And I built that house of cards. And I got so good that I could even put a second story on it. In fact, I got some good. I made a pyramid out of it one time. A pretty good looking pyramid. Until my stupid sister came along and knocked it down. <laughs> but she was only retaliating for what I knocked down in her little playroom the other day. All right, so, but the Bible says, for every house, and notice that every house is builded. Notice that building, some effort was made, a plan was designed, and uh, wisdom was involved. For every house is built by some man, but he that buildeth all things is God. Take your Bible and go to Psalm chapter 102. God is a builder. Amen. It said right there, but he that buildeth all things is God. Is that true? God is a builder. Amen. Amen. He's a builder. When he made things, he didn't just say, oh, just all at once, wham. No, he started out and said, let there be light. That needs to come first. Uh, uh, let, let the earth and the, dry, and the water of, uh, be gathered together. That needs to be second. And he, he built it upon things. He was a builder. Uh, it took six days. He didn't just do it all in one hour. He could have. He could have just said, let it all happen. You know? But no, he, he, he wanted us to see how he did it. He wrote it in detail on how he did it and how he laid a foundation and how he built on that foundation. And when he was done, he looked back and said, it's good. It's good. I like it. And I'm just going to rest. I think that's a complete job. That's exactly what I designed before the foundation of the world. It's exactly, I had a plan. I had a blueprint and I already had it before I, before the first day, before I said, let there be light. I already had a blueprint. I already had it all laid out. I knew exactly what I was going to do, how I was going to do it, and when I was going to do it. And I used wisdom to draw the plan. I used power to get it done. Amen. And I put it to action. Amen. And I built. I built. I built a universe. I built a world. I put people and animals and plants and fish in the sea and molecules. I made the stars and the heavens, and everything was constructed perfectly. I made the seasons. I put the sun just the perfect distance for man to be warmed in the summer and cooled in the winter. Everything was designed by my wisdom and perfection, and all of it was holy, all of it was perfect, and all of it had structure and design to accomplish eternity that I could enjoy with my creation. But I wanted you and I to see that it wasn't just uh, casually thrown out, but it was purpose and design and an actual building. And he didn't have to do it that way. He did it uh, to show us how to make something that would last forever. And so he did it that way. And the Bible, uh, I think I got you somewhere. Where, where have I got you? Psalm 102 and verse 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. In Zechariah 12, 1, he says this, and I'll just read it. 
The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. What a verse. What a verse of a, of a, of a builder that did these things. He had a plan. Uh, he, he had a blueprint. He uh, had design. Uh, before the foundation was laid, it was, it was planned and designed. And he sat down and he thought, I want to create things that will last forever. And when he made them, he made them in perfection with not one flaw. Not one flaw. And even, even giving man the choice to do wrong was perfect. Because how beautiful is a free, is a free man. And how wrong is a caged man or a robot, but a free man that can show how he really feels of his own free will to choose God or not, or to love him or to hate him or to serve him or not to serve him. How perfect is that? Amen. And, and so when God gets all those things to enjoy, it's from a pure heart. A choice that someone would make of their own free will. Not being, uh, not, not being uh, made to worship him, but of their own free will get to. You know, it's a beautiful thing to see you guys pray. No one's making you do that. You decide to do that. You say, I will kneel. I will pray to my maker. I will acknowledge him today. I'm not like the heathen that regard him not. But I take time and I, I hope in him. And I call on him. And he's part of my life. And that's my choice. No one's making me do this. No one makes me go to church. No one makes me serve him. No one makes me pray to him. I do that of my own. Because I want to. Because I believe in him. He has given me life. I, I feel indebted to him. I like serving him. I like loving him. It, it's fun. It's enjoyable to me. And it's my choice. And he didn't make me do it. All he did is let me know that he's there. And let me know what kind of God he was. And if I want to serve him, I can. And if I don't want to, I don't have to. Because there's lots of people that don't want to. As proof of the other side. Take your Bible and go to Proverbs chapter 8. And we'll look at verse 33. Proverbs 8, and uh, uh, you, most of you know Proverbs 8 is all about wisdom and that creative power that God used to create. Uh, chapter 8 and verse 33. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. 35. For whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. And you see the two sides of the coin of life and death. Things that live because of perfection and things that die because of corruption. And the Bible says sin, uh, uh, wherefore uh, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. That's why it passed. That's why it exists. That's why death came. is because of rebellion against the holy law. That's why it's there. That's why people die. That's why carpets get old. That's why we have to repaint. By the way, it sure looks nice. And you guys painted and went to a lot of work. And it sure looks so much better. All those splotches and holes that were on those walls, it sure looks better. I sure appreciate you guys that came out for a work day. That's a real blessing. Uh, take your Bible, go to Genesis chapter 1, and then we'll move to the next point here. The first point is God's a builder. God's a builder. And, uh, and everything he made was perfect and holy, and there was no corruption in any of it until man decided to defile it by his own free will to use it against God's ways. And when it did, it caused destruction and uh, a ceasing of the life that it had. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful. Well, he likes life, doesn't he? Yeah. Be fruitful. Have me a I want babies everywhere. <laughs> yeah, he does. And multiply. Look at it. He says it twice. And replenish. There's a third time. The whole earth. I want the whole place just packed. Amen. 
and subdue it and have dominion. That means I'm letting you have the rule over what I made. Yeah. He doled out authority. He passed it on. He had authority. It was all his. He passed it out to you and I. And he said this, have dominion over the fish of the sea. And we do. We can outswim any of them. Is that right? Now you find the fastest, oh yeah, you find the fastest fish you can, I got a boat passing right up. And I'll throw a spear in his side while I go by him. I mean, man, man can do, he, he can outswim the fastest fish. He can outrun the cheetah. Amen. He can fly faster than any bird. I'm not talking about his physical capability. I'm talking, well, he used his brain to make stuff that can do that. So he's got dominion. And they, nothing's above him. Right? He's the, he's the main target. I mean, he's the main guy in the world. We, we play with animals if we want to. We make sport of them. We'll eat them if we want to. We'll, we'll sport if we want to. We'll do whatever. We'll train them if we want to. Do whatever we want with them. We are totally authority over them. They can't outmatch our, our thinking. They can't beat us. We're over them. And he says this, and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, verse 29, and God said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed. And they're still around. It's amazing. Which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a, a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for me. And to every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw uh, everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So it is plain for us to see today that God's focus on uh, uh, focus was on life and that that. Life would be everlasting and perfect. And then man comes along. And when man comes along, uh, uh, he uh, defiles uh, the family and kills his own brother. He comes along and eats, a tr eats from a tree that he was told not to eat from. And death came to all men. And nature was part of the result because when... Uh, when he judged Satan for what he did, he cursed. And when he judged man for what he did, he cursed. He said, Every, from now on, when you till the ground and when you work, you'll do it by the sweat of your brow. And he just, and then the women, because you hearken to him and uh, this, the devil, then you're going to have uh, childbearing pains. That's why ladies go through so much trouble in giving children birthing children, and he goes on and says some other things about that, uh, showing that, uh, 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 and you guys all know this, that every single thing on this planet, all of it, no exceptions, has been defiled. And the reason you know that is because nothing is eternal. Everything has come to corrosion and corruptness, except for politics, of course. That's one of the most corrupt things. Uh, every, every, doesn't matter where you go, everything now degenerates and, 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 wear, and, and wears out. Rust and corruption and all that is here. And nothing was according to God's original intent. The intent was that it would all stay holy that it would all last forever, and I would enjoy it. Once they do fill the earth and subdue the earth and populate the earth, I get it all. <laughs> I get it all. And so happy about that. And I'm sure was elated about how things would go. But when man corrupted, he, he had another plan. And I want you to see it. Let's take your Bible and go to Matthew 16. And God had another plan to get back what he initially started. And I want you to see it. Once again, God has something that is perfect. Once again, God has something that will be everlasting again and not be defiled, not be corrupted, and not even have a chance of being corrupted. Man, what, a, what, a, what an exhilarating thought. Matthew 16 and verse 18. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build, he's a builder, 
my church. Well, that's different. Before you created the heavens and the earth, you created the stars and the sun and the solar system, you created life upon the earth and fish and birds and man, but now you do something different. And he says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against that. It did before, but not this one. I'm going to build something this time that is not going to be destroyed. I don't care what man does to it. I don't care what all the demons in hell try to do to it. Nothing is going to stop this one. This one's going to be holy. This one's going to be perfect. And there's going to be no way for anything to stop it. Wow. And he called it a church. I'll build my church. And you and I both know it had nothing to do with this building. It has to do with the souls of men and women being made holy by the Lord Jesus Christ and by his wonderful gospel. And nothing could ever change that or cause it to decay no matter what anybody ever does. And the gates of hell will not prevail against this new thing that I am going to build. And he looks at Peter and he says, I'm starting with you, buddy. I'm starting with you. And I know he's the, uh, Jesus is the one that is founded on bond because later on Paul says, I lay a, I'm a master builder and I, my, my foundation is Jesus Christ. So we know when he said upon this church, I'll build, upon the, I'll build my church, he's talking about himself. But he's going to use Peter to get it kicked off, but he went over to Pentecost and did so. Amen. All right, so uh, uh, hell shall not prevail against it. In no way Satan uh, is going to overcome this one or stop this one or defile it or corrupt it. As far as this whole world is concerned, God has no interest in anything that's not of this new work. This new work is my church. This new work is holy. This new work cannot be stopped. I don't really care about the rest of it. If it has potential to be part of this church, I'm all for that. Other than that, I got no interest. I got no interest. Uh, I, I got no interest in, uh, in uh, the Dodgers winning the, the, the World Series. Unless there's a Christian in there that, uh, that, uh, that somebody will say, oh, how was that game? And how did you guys get so good? And I, I, before I say anything, I want to acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. Those words there, they come into play. Everything else, we don't care. God don't care. We do. We watch it. We go, oh, look how happy they are. Boy, weren't they good. Our team was the best. And, oh, we were so happy about all that. And God just going... None of it matters to me because it's all corrupted. That trophy's corrupt. That coach is going to get old and die. All you players are going to be has been 10 years from now and they don't even know who you are. And we'll try to bring your name up. And oh, yeah, I remember that a long time ago. And it, none of it matters at all. And let alone talk about 100 years later yeah. or 1,000 years later when everybody that was even alive in that day is now dead. Who even cares about what happened when the Dodgers won that thing? And all I'm saying, what we are just so excited about, and I'm one of you, uh, so excited. I love the Dodgers going to the World Series. I think I watched every game. I enjoyed all of it. But the whole time, I just think to myself, you know, here's this hockey team, and they come out, and they got this big golden trophy, and they kiss this golden trophy, and they hold it up like that, and everybody goes, yeah, we won. We won. We are the world best. We're the world champ. And 20 years, 100 years later, that thing is in some museum somewhere all corroded and rusty, and no one even cares who won it and don't even know who won it. And if they read the fine print and saw who won it, it wouldn't even, they wouldn't even know who they are 100 years later. You say, why? Because it meant nothing. It meant nothing. It's not part, it's not part of, this, of this new thing that I built. This new thing that I built is called a church. And the only thing that matters to God is that. And everything within it, thoughts, prayers, deeds, faith, works, everything that has to do with benefiting that cause and that cause only, that's what I care about. I don't care about the rest of it. The rest of it, I would care about it. I care about the potential that the rest of it has. But other than that, I got no interest. I'm glad he cares about the potential because I got in. Yeah. I was lost at one time, and he cared about the potential. He said, well, there's a guy that's got potential. Maybe we can get him in this thing. And somebody came and got me in. Now I'm in. Now you're in. But that's all that matters, the potential. 
of a lost and dying world. There's potential out there. But there's also an existence of a church. We got one. We're sitting in the middle of a body of Christ. And all that matters to him is how you build one another, how you treat one another, how you pray for one another, how you help one another. That, that stupid little thing we did last night is just a bunch of, of fleshy stuff that all mattered because it was part of the church. It encouraged people. It ministered to children. Somebody did a lot of work to make it happen. That stuff counts. Amen. Because that's, if God says, I'm a builder, and I lay a foundation, and I build it and build it, and I work out a work that I'm going to collect someday. And, when he, and, and that gets corrupted, but not this one. Not this one. This one starts, and this one does not get corrupt. No matter what people do, no matter what the devil does, this one stays intact. Therefore, his focus is only on that. I don't care about the rest of it. You guys can race boats. You guys can win wars. You guys can laud each other and pray to each other around and celebrate and party and you can enjoy and you can get drunk and you can get doped and all hide up. You can do whatever you want. I could give a rip. You guys just help yourself. Your choice. You make your own bed. You sleep in it. I'll tell you what I am interested in. I'm interested in my church. And I'll tell you something else I'm interested in. I'm interested in this guy helping the cause because he's part of that church. I don't care about nothing else. I don't care. He can do anything he wants in his life, but I'm only interested in what he does to help my work. I'm interested in this guy. Man, I don't care about what he does. He can do all kinds of stupid things. Maybe he does. I know I do from time to time. I just do stupid things sometimes. None of that matters. I don't care about that. I care about one thing. I care about church. I care about helping that church. I care about the church's health. I care about the spirituality of the church. I care about everybody that's in the church. I don't care if it's a prayer said for somebody. I don't care if it's a deed done by somebody. I don't care if it's some of faith that you share to someone. I don't care what it is. If it promotes the church or promotes its cause, I'm the God of that. Because I like life and I like perfection and nothing else is. Just that. <laughs> Just that. Boy, does that help you focus on what you're living for? Doesn't that help? That helps me. It helps me focus. In fact, that's the name of my, my message tonight or this morning is called, uh, what did I call it? Uh, the Focus on Life, I think. The Focus on Life Eternal. That's the name of the message, Nathan, if you want to print that out. Thank you. Take your Bible. We're going to get ready to close. Let's look at Ephesians 2. I want you to see that God expects you to build just like he did. He built it. He went to a lot of trouble to fashion it. He had a plan. He implemented that plan. He had wisdom. He had some thought, went into it. Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll look at verse uh, 17. And came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, mm. and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built, and there's that word, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, there's that word again, fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. The focus is on what we will do as helping that, helping that church helping further that endeavor that God started. It is to build itself. It is to be nourished and strengthened. I feel sorry for the man or the woman that hurts the church. Amen. I do. I feel sorry for him because it's not, it's not what God's focusing on. He's focusing on its betterment and everything that can be done 
uh, to ensure and cause it to flourish and multiply. Now take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul was a builder. We think of him as an apostle. We think of him as a great Christian. He has a good testimony, and all of that is true. But he was a builder, a Christian builder, and uh, he worked hard at it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Oh, some guy planted a seed in the ground and walked away. Some guy came along later and watered it, and he walked away. But they're one. What were they one in? They're one in the effort. They're one in the life of that plant. Whatever they planted, they worked together to make it happen. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So there was a prize given for the effort. He said, the guy that planted the seed, I'm going to reward him the same as I did the guy that watered it. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right. Verse 9, for we are laborers together. We're a team. Laborers together with God. Well, God's involved. Yeah, he's the one who gives the increase. We do the labor. He brings the fruit out of the plant. We put the seed in. Amen. We, we put the water on it. We even cultivate a little bit. But as far as the life coming out, he does that. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. You are God's building. He says you're a building. Verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another built it thereon. But every man, take heed how he buildeth thereon. Boy, it gives life a whole new purpose. It gives your life a, a means of worth. You no longer, when you were lost, all you did was spin your wheels. As far as being worth something in this life, you had nothing going on as far as God was concerned. There was nothing you were doing that he enjoyed other than maybe you took pleasure in the fact he gave you life, but as far as your life and what it means and what purpose you had, you got no interest whatsoever. Other than the possibility, as I said before, possibility that, that maybe, maybe this guy, show him the gospel, he might just say, I got that. Other than that, I, I look at my life, 21 years of my life, it's just a, just a, a, a waste. All that fun, we were water skiers. You know who got saved because I was a water skier? Nobody. Nobody. You know how many churches got a benefit from me as a water skier? I could barefoot. Yeah, I get to ski off and ski on my bare feet. So I did it. I did it. So what are you saying? It was just a waste. I, it was fun. And I, I'm sure God enjoyed that I had enjoy out of it. But as far as accomplishing something with my life, absolutely zero. Nothing to it. When I got older, I partied, drank, doped, smoked, cussed, and all the rest of it. And all of that benefited nothing to God. Absolutely nothing. The only redeeming value in this young man is the possibility that maybe, given the chance, he may get into this thing that I care about. You, you followed the message this morning. The message this morning is you and I actually have a part of something eternal if we'd invest in that. There's nothing else even worthwhile. Amen. You, you know why I still like to get out away from town and even get away from church and maybe go do something that's not church related? The only, the only thing I, I like about that is it refreshes me. And I get away and I come back with a better attitude. And I come back rested up and I'm ready to charge again. That's the only thing it really is. While I'm out there, there's nothing going on. Unless I get a few tracks on. I usually try to do that. You don't get a few tracks on. Well, then that, just put nothing to it. Uh, Brother Spurge and I, we like to get on our bikes and just go for a ride. Sometimes we'll go three or four days. Just go a couple thousand miles. Just drive, just, just a ride. Just to be out and ride and stop for gas and gas bag a little bit, fellowship a little bit, get on the motorcycle, fill them up with gas and go again. Hit some motel somewhere, go have dinner together, spend a night at some motel, get up the next morning, get on the bike and go again. You know, because it's all that nothing. The only thing it does is that it, 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 it sharpens us, because iron sharpens iron. Uh, plus, we're 
Christian then, so we live Christian lives. You know, we're not drinking or doing something evil. But the, the best part about it is we come back rested and ready to go again. That's all I'm looking at this morning was that God wants you and I to be builders. Build the church. Benefit the church. Help the church any way possible. Amen. Oh, what a blessing. Uh, take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians 3. And just to wrap things up a little bit here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Down to verse 13. Every man's work. See that building there? That's, he's, he's a builder. If any, uh, he says, every man's work shall be made manifest. What's that word mean? Well, it's come to light, to be revealed. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work. See that building? Of what sort it is. What sort is it? What, what did the work produce for my church? Verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Amen. Uh, to build with love for Jesus Christ. To build with uh, what he wants out of, out of it. Love is a necessary thing. He says, and, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profited me nothing. So the attitude is important. If you're going to build, you have to have a genuine love for the cause, for Jesus Christ. Phony works won't go. They have to be pure works. And if it is, then it, it gets a reward. Take your Bible and go to Galatians 2. In Galatians 4, he says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I don't want to spin my wheels. I don't want to work and have it come to nothing. I want to make sure it pans out. And so he labored hard. In Galatians 2, in verse 2, he says, I went up by revelation. Notice that. I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any man's I should run or had run in vain. It would have been foolish for me not to have direction from God. I went up by revelation. I got direction from God. And I knew what I was doing was going to benefit him because that he told me what to do. He told me how to do it. And I did it. And, uh, and that's how you work. You don't want to just do because you feel uh, like that would be a good idea. You want to be impressed by God do it, by revelation. You want to know, you want to feel like, man, uh, that's so-and-so, they, they really need prayer. I'm going to pray for them. You really believe, you know, you, you're, you're coming to God and praying. Uh, I, want to, I, want to give, I want to give Brother Andrews $1,000. Uh, uh, that would be a real good thing to do, you know. Amen. Uh, I'm teasing. Uh, but whatever you're impressed to do. That God impressed you to do. He said, I went up by revelation. If I hadn't had that, that I knew my direction was right and from God, it would have been labor in vain. I, I spun my wheel. It would been no, no value. He says, lest I bestow my labor. In, in, uh, he said, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. It would have been a useless effort. All right, lastly, I'll say this. That uh, when Solomon built the temple, uh, he laid the foundation of the Greek stones. Remember? And the building went up, and it took 46 years to build it. And anywhere during that time, he could just stand back and go, boy, it's coming along good. You know, we need a little more work on that right side, but man, it's looking good here, and it's, boy, it's beautiful there. And when it was all done, he could look back and he'd go, it's magnificent. I think Brian preached on magnificent. And all the gems and the jewels, it was a beautiful work. Uh, and he could look back at it and go, boy, that was really worth the effort because it's going to be nice. Boy, our priests can come in here and our, our, our whole city, this is a focal point for our, our religion, our, our faith in God. And boy, this is the center of it, you know, it's a real big deal. And I think Mo, uh, Noah could do the same thing. He'd get halfway through building that ark and go, man, it's going along pretty good. Those trusses are looking right, you know, and all those boards. Man, he said, man, I think this is working good. He can look back and if you don't get to do this, you labor for God. You just keep laboring. You just keep laying stuff. You just keep working. 
And no matter how long that goes, I'm 70. And I've been saved since I was 21. And I couldn't even give a slightest account of if I did anything to God. I, I have no how much to thank him. I know there's something there. I know there's some things there. It's got to be. But I don't know how much. I can't look back. I can't tally it. I, I don't know. And half of it is not even genuine. I mean, if I was to lay everything in a pile that I thought that I did for God, maybe half. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't get to do what Solomon did. I don't get to do what Noah did. And sometimes it's a little discouraging for you. You keep serving, you keep serving, you keep serving, and you never really get to see how things are going. But one day, you will. At the judgment seat of Christ, it's all going to come out. And I think some of you are going to be real surprised. And when I say that, I mean it positively. Because some of the things that you thought weren't going to get anything, you're going to be surprised at how much you got. Some of the you thought you'd get a lot for, maybe not. I don't know. I fear the judgment seat of Christ. I'm sure most of you do too. I know we'll all fall short somewhere. Amen. But you don't get to look back and see what, you don't get to be encouraged by that. But you do get to be encouraged by uh, a surprise is coming. <laughs> we like surprises. And there's a big one coming. And, and I think most of it's going to be pretty good. Since all the sin is going to be paid for, there's going to be a lot of it that's pretty good, I think. So I wanted to let you guys know this morning, my morning message is a focus on a life eternal. And that has to do with something Jesus Christ built. And it's a church. And that Paul was a wise master builder to do the same thing. And that every Christian is given the admonition to make your life worthwhile. And it ain't in the world. It ain't in the world. Unless there's somebody in the world you can reach, potentials out there. But as far as the life of God, I wonder how much your life just goes up in smoke. How much I, I, I get caught up in I, I know nobody else is like this, but every once in a while I get caught up on spider solitaire. I like spider solitaire. It's a, it's a dumb game. You know, and, and, I get, uh, and I get caught up in that thing. And sometimes I look and be so honored. I just, that's so many things to do. And I just waste two hours, <laughs> you know, on solitaire or TV or internet or whatever we do. Some of it's got a little value to it. Maybe it encourages you. Maybe it sharpens your brain. Maybe maybe you get some redeeming value out of it. But the main thing God wants us to see today is that he wants everybody to be a builder. Everything's about building. Everything's about building the church that cannot be destroyed and cannot be corrupted. All right, let's all stand this morning. Every part of it, every part.